name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. For today, the Ember Wednesday of Advent, uh, we have uh, six readings, six epistles, and one gospel for today. And so um, we will uh, speak a little bit about each one and also the prayers uh, in between as um, just salutary advice, uh, helpful um, wisdom, uh, we could say, on our path to acquire sanctity and uh, to understand ourselves even. For we we are a mystery unto ourselves. So let's see. Um, for this week, that's Saturday. You know, I, and there are prophecies as well, uh, prophecies in Scripture that the prophets didn't even know how literal they were. Like we have here, right away at the very beginning, intro it, Psalm seventy nine. Come, O Lord, and show Thy face to us, Thou that sittest upon the cherubim, and we shall be saved. Um, Show thy face to us. He had no idea how literally that would happen, right? Uh, the Shroud of Turin, uh, that God would take human form and uh, so that he might have a face, so that he might show us to us. This is how Scripture can be fulfilled in ways e even the prophets don't, don't realize. Uh, they would write that um, allegorically, right? Show thy face to us. Just like we say, we hope the sun shines upon us, right? Show, show, the sun, show us thy face. Um, just meaning that, that we want the sunlight, right? It, it, we want it to appear, the, 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 the warmth and so on. Uh, so, and similar to the Lord, like good things shine upon us, show thy face in terms of fortune and goodness and so on. How little they could have known uh, that it would be literal. And that, so that is the intro prayer, or the, the, the intro it, and then the prayer is, oh, this is very good. O God, who dost behold how we are afflicted by reason of our wickedness, mercifully grant that we may be consoled by reason of thy visitation. Suffering is a remedy for ignorance. We are afflicted by reason of our wickedness. And this is so important. Here's a lesson that, that, that would be good to, to, and we haven't even gotten to the first readings yet. This is just the intro and the prayer. Uh, so often we suffer because of our wickedness. It's what we have done that causes us the suffering. Um, I mean, imagine, oh, I don't know, emotionally, socially, in our family, the effects of a hangover. You get drunk. You get a hangover. You feel sick to your stomach. The next morning, you feel terrible, right? That's a very easy connection to make. It's much less easy to see that by our selfishness, by our pettiness, by our immaturity, we're the cause of the suffering in our own families, in our social circles, in my life, in my work, in my whatever it may be. It's less easy to see those connections. Um, and, but we'll see. We're going to see this, this, this theme of suffering as... Um, uh, is something that instructs us or some th suffering as a result of our own wickedness. We're going to see that theme continued throughout the prayers for, for this day, uh, this Ember Saturday, uh, but also that uh, uh, God, uh, Christ our Lord, desires to relieve us of this suffering. We, we ask for that relief of the suffering, but very often it comes in, in the form of wisdom. It doesn't come as in like God removing the pain, uh, but rather God imparting a wisdom that helps uh, us to make use of the pain, to understand it and turn it towards a good end. And, and that brings consolation. Uh, the, the pain is still there, but now there's a purpose and a reason to it. That's, that's a very important lesson to, to, to apply to our lives. Um, in fact, if I could make a little reference, um, Viktor Frankl wrote a book. Um, it was called Man's Search for Meaning. He was a, a Holocaust survivor, a uh, victim of Auschwitz. And he found that what kept people going in the greatest suffering, you know, among the greatest suffering you can imagine, was meaning. Did they find meaning and purpose in their suffering? That's th those are the ones who, who survived. Uh, anyway, so that just shows how important meaning and purpose is in our lives, in human existence, because God is the ultimate meaning. So uh, let's see. The first lesson, lesson from Isaiah chapter 19, In those days they shall cry out to the Lord because of the oppressor. And he shall send them a savior and a defender to deliver them. And who are their oppressors on all sides? You know, the Philistines, the Assyrians, and especially the Egyptians. The Egyptians are a represented sin. Uh, Moses taking the Israelites out of Egypt, uh, out of the land of sin, out of darkness, into the promised land. So Egypt is kind of like, of all the evil, Egypt is the source of it all, right? That's where we came out of it, and we never want to go back to. And so in this prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah 19, they shall cry to the Lord because of the oppressor, and he shall send them a savior to deliver them. Uh, who, who is their, their, their oppressor? Is, is Egypt, right? Their oppressor is sin. Their oppressor is the devil, and so on. And uh, how shall they be delivered? 
the Lord will crush the enemies, the Lord will break the arm, the Lord will break the teeth. I mean, yeah, that's there in Scripture. But here we have the mercy of God, Isaiah 19. And the Lord shall be known by Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day. And they shall worship him with sacrifices and offerings, and they shall make vows to the Lord and perform them. And the Lord shall strike Egypt with a scourge, and shall heal it. And they shall return to the Lord, and he shall be pacified towards them, and the Lord our God shall heal them. Here you have, once again, the difference in the Hebrew scriptures, the true scriptures, as opposed to all the other religions, is uh, the Lord God heals the enemies of the true religion. He wants to love them all. He wants to save them all. This is that idea of the Catholic Church, the universal church. And, and for us, a conversion of our worst enemy is possible. Conversion of those whom we think this is a source of all of our problems and misery and suffering, if that person would just die, God wants to convert them. But he does it by striking them. When the Lord strikes, it is to heal. Right? If he causes suffering, it is to our good. And that's important for us to remember. Let's go back. What did the, what's the prayer we just read? We are afflicted by reason of our wickedness. Grant that we may be consoled by the reason of thy visitation. Our Lord, we are suffering because of our wickedness. Uh, and very often, how the Lord strikes us is the consequences of our own actions. He just he doesn't add anything extra. He simply lets us suffer what we've done to ourselves. That's how he strikes. And why? If, if, if we accept that, if we look for that con- connection and say, okay, why am I suffering? It's because of what I've done. What's the connection? Um, have I caused this to myself? And is there a way I can not do this in the future? What do I need to change about me to improve my sufferings now? We always want to point to somebody else, my husband, my wife, my kids, my job, the church, the pope, my priests, whatever. Look to ourselves. Um, and, and, and I'm very often, right, all those people that we think are our enemy, our husband, our wife, our kids, our church, our priests, our bishop, the pope, they can be converted. After I've been converted of my bad attitude of not realizing uh, my part in my sufferings. And very often, right, what's our part in my sufferings? My sufferings is fear is confusion, is, oh, no, what's going to happen next? We need to be healed. We need more faith. Uh, And, okay, we've gotten into the first lesson. We've got six more to go. Hmm. Lesson uh, two, Isaiah 35. Hmm. Yeah, say to the faint-hearted, take courage and fear not. Behold, your God will bring revenge uh, of recompense. Uh, God is not going to save us from hard times difficult times, or even confusing times. That's why uh, otherwise the the scriptures wouldn't be filled with admonitions to take courage and fear not and stand firm, uh, because God's going to let us undergo very difficult times that require all those virtues. Uh, But God himself will come and will save you. Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. God himself will come and will save you, right? Remember that what we saw at the intro, God himself, again, the the, 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 uh, prophets, you know, maybe they had an idea, Mm maybe not, uh, that God would become incarnate. That's one of those things to where it is not possible for man to know this unless he be enlightened by God. No possible way could man have even suspected uh, God Almighty, the um, eternal and infinite God, will become a man. Nobody could think of that on their own. Uh, That's why Christ says to St. Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Uh, So another prophecy of the incarnation, God himself will come and will save you. And then here we have, remember, the uh, Christ's reply to the disciples of John the Baptist. Are you he who is to come, or are we to look for another? And our Lord says, uh, go and relate to John what you see and what you hear. Uh, What what does Christ our Lord say? In part, the prophecy given here in Isaiah chapter 35. Then shall the eyes of the blind be open, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall be free. Uh, So, you know, our Lord is the fulfillment of all of these prophecies here in Isaiah and elsewhere as well. And and um, there's an, a part at the end of this lesson, Isaiah 35, relating to Christ being uh, uh, pierced by the side and, and water and blood coming out. Um, why, why shall the, the, the blind see and the deaf hear? Uh, for waters are broken out in the desert and streams in the wilderness. And that which was dry land shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water, saith the Lord Almighty. Anytime you hear of these prophecies of a future watering of the land or water flowing out from the side of the temple, that's the piercing of Christ's side, right? Obviously, Christ is a temple. He was speaking of the temple of his body, and water shall flow from the temple. Uh, So anytime you see those those kinds of prophecies, they're relating to Christ's uh, side and and the water flowing from it, which represents baptism, 
and the blood flowing from it, which represents uh, um, the Eucharist. So all the sacraments there are, are, are represented. Uh, moving on, we have the next prayer. Uh, gladden, we beseech thee, O Lord, with the coming of thy only begotten Son, us, thine unworthy servants, who are saddened by the guilt of our own deeds. Once again, we are saddened by the guilt of our own deeds. We see we have done wrong, and, and it's important that we are saddened by it. And this is the, the flesh lusting against the Spirit. Um, we, 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 we say with St. Paul, that which I would do, I do not, and that which I would not do, that is what I do. Uh, we, we know it. We know we shouldn't be committing these sins. Why am I committing the same sins over and over and over again? We are weak. The flesh is lusting against the Spirit. And we are unworthy servants. And we're saddened by the guilt of our own deeds. We should feel that guilt. We should feel sad with guilt over our own sins. But there's good guilt and there's bad guilt. As I say many, many times, uh, bad guilt depresses you, makes you think, what's the point? Why should I even try? I try so hard and I fail. That is bad guilt. Good guilt inspires us to try harder, right? We're saddened by them, but it fills us with resolve. Don't dwell on bad guilt, right? Motivate yourself and say, okay, if I feel guilty, what am I going to do about it? What am I going to change? Uh, third lesson, Isaiah 40. We are going to skip that one for now. There's some things there, but not quite so, so evident. Um, we've got plenty to talk about in the remaining lessons. Uh, lesson 4, Isaiah 45. Oh, now this is fascinating. And we could all give a whole sermon here. Um, uh, Thus saith the Lord to my anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have taken hold of to subdue nations before his face and to turn back the kings and to open the doors before him and the gates shall not be shut. Uh, and I will give thee hidden treasures, concealed riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I am the Lord, who call thee by name the God of Israel. I girded thee and thou hast not known me. Oh, fascinating. So Cyrus. Cyrus is the king of the Persians who sends the Israelites back to the promised land. Uh, the uh, prophet um, Ezra, um, oh, I don't know if it was he, but th they showed him in the scriptures. Cyrus, you have been prophesied about. The Lord has chosen you as his instrument to uh, restore his people Israel's, uh, to restore them to, to the proper worship of God. And Cyrus was a pagan. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't even a member of the true religion. And yet he is prophesied about in Scripture as being God's instrument to subdue nations, to turn back kings, and to open the doors before him, right? And, not, and that the gates shall not be shut. Uh, God does this. God chooses whomever he wants, whoever he wills, to restore his church. Even if that happens to be a member, uh, somebody who's not a member of a church, who does indeed hold a high political office. Yes. So it's possible here. Now, we ought not to put our hope in that in um, salvation from a political leader. If that happens, it is only because of God's um, uh, choosing. And yet there are those who, you know, who would say that, uh, well, our, we shouldn't put our hope in uh, the elections this year, or we shouldn't be looking to these political leaders, our, hope, our, 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 our salvation is going to come from God. Well, God, sh God has to choose some instrument. Somebody's got to do it. As I say it's many times also, uh, Christ already came down once and saved the world himself. He's not going to do it again. The next time he comes, he's not going to save the world, but be to judge the world. So he's got to choose somebody to restore the church, and it could very well be a political leader. God can choose whoever he wants to do it. Um, <clears throat> our task is not to get caught up in that hope and think, oh, it's got to be this one for sure, this president, that prime minister, this demagogue, this whoever. We're not going to know who it is until after it happens. After it happens, then you know. Uh, but beforehand, it's not so clear, right? The Old Testament was different. The prophets were making prophecies in real time, like it was actually happening. Uh, nowadays, prophecies, uh, prophecies ceased with the death of the last apostle. Um, so, uh, we don't, we, but we just don't know, right? We don't know what God is going to do. He can choose whoever he wants. And if God does choose that, that kind of thing, it is always, why? So that thou mayest know that I am the Lord who called thee by name. Right? God will always do these things, uh, not for our comfort, but for our benefit, for the benefit of the church to draw souls uh, to the true church. Um, and I, I just think it's very interesting. I girded thee, and thou hast not known me. Um, you know, you, you, you pagans, you haven't even known that I'm, I am the true God, and yet I have girded you, and I've given you strength. So God, again, uh, acts as he wills. Uh, and then the other lesson, oh, lesson five, uh, this is from the book of Daniel. 
And this is uh, the, about the three youths who were thrown into the fiery furnace for refusing to bow to political pressure. And they continued to worship the Lord God. And that got them into hot water. That got them thrown into a fiery furnace. And they were preserved by an angel who came down and three men were thrown in. And behold, what did the servants uh, of, of the king see? They saw four men in the furnace. And the fourth had the appearance of one uh, whose raiment was white as snow and his face was as lightning and so on, as usual when people see an angel. And the angel uh, drove the heat from the furnace and made the air as though uh, the gentle breeze bringing dew in the morning time. Uh, so this is a lesson to us that, yes, when we stand firm for our faith, we might be horribly tortured like the, the seven sons, uh, you know, um, um, in, in um, oh, what was it, I, not Maccabees, but, but one, one of the books, uh, the mother with her seven sons, they were all tortured and killed. But we may also be preserved, uh, right, by the angel. Uh, but spiritually, right, spiritually speaking, we will always be preserved uh, from the fires of sin, right, the fires of temptation if we are firm. And that is more, you know, there's, there's, there's a physical lesson, but there's also a spiritual and a logical lesson as well. Uh, we can be tried by fire physically or tried by fear, fire spiritually. Um, and what follows this lesson, uh, Daniel uh, chapter 3, uh, the, the, the last lesson before the epistle, is a canticle of the, the three youths sing. Um, Benedictus est Domine Deus Patum Nostrodum. It, Benedictum, Benedictus est. It, it, it's it's um, a, a, a famous sequence. Um, very long, and it's all about um, uh, bless the Lord, uh, you know, lightnings and clouds, bless the Lord, angels and saints, bless the Lord, heavens and earth, uh, blessed be thou in the ho thy holy kingdom. Um, the idea is, you know, light, um, a night and darkness, light and day, uh, uh, hills and mountains, valleys and rivers. What they're saying is everybody should bless the Lord all the time, in darkness and in light, in good times and in bad, in times of prosperity, times of despair, uh, times of suffering, times of uh, rejoicing. Bless the Lord, right? All things have come from God. All things will return to him. Uh, do not lose heart in any circumstance. Always bless the Lord. And when were they singing that canticle? In the midst of the furnace of fire, and they were untouched, unharmed. So you've, you've got kind of the, uh, the combination of opposites there, uh, which God can do, right? Can, God can do all things. Mm. And then the epistle to Thessalonians. Now, this is very interesting in that uh, Blessed Paul is talking about the man of sin. The man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition who opposes us. Uh, so this is a kind of a prophecy related to the end times. Um, there's a whole separate sermon we could do on this one. Uh, the idea, though, is stand firm, right? No man knows the day nor the hour. Are these the end times? You know, the Jews in the Babylonian captivity. Was this it? Was this the destruction of Israel? But they had the promise, right? A son of David shall sit on the throne forever. So it couldn't have been the end yet. And we've had uh, promises, right? Until the man of sin be revealed, until the son of perdition, until all these things. Now, we don't know exactly what that means, but there are still prophecies yet to be fulfilled. Uh, what are they going to be? Uh, we'll know after they happen, as, as I've said before. Uh, but for us in the meantime, it's not going to be evil. or It's not going to be easy uh, because there is the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of evil. Why is God allowing so much evil? Um, and St. Paul speaks a little bit about this. Uh, the mystery of iniquity already worketh. Uh, God can turn good to evil. It's a mystery. Why does God permit this? Yeah, mysterious. Who knows? For his own inscrutable reasons. How could God possibly turn this iniquity to goodness? Well, he can, right? And the ultimate example of that is the cross, right? The greatest evil became the greatest good. Uh, the death of God, the murder of God became the salvation of man. So God can, can, can reconcile those opposites. And, and then there are our closing reading for today of these, these many readings is the gospel. And, and this is... I just, I, I, I'm, this is something so important to know uh, in response to false claims about the gospel or the gospel writers. It begins as Luke chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and Philip his brother the tetrarch of Ituria, and the country of Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilena, under the high priest Annas and Caiaphas, the, wor the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zachary, in the desert. So I think it was like almost a minute of precision. When did John the Baptist come? This is who he, this is who his father was. This is who the high priests were. This was the governor of this region, and here was the governor of this other region, and oh, here was the emperor, and here was the. They were extremely careful about what they were saying. 
they, they included all these details um, um, so you could know exactly and pinpoint precision where and who the, the, the prophecy, the forerunner of the Messiah was. The gospel writers were very concerned with accuracy. They were not making things up. Uh, they were not like, oh, you know, maybe this, maybe that, whatever. They were not imprecise. They were extremely precise. And it's passages just like this one that uh, clue us into that. Um, in in um, uh, map reading, when, when, you, when you've got like a compass and you're trying to find your way through, through unfamiliar territory, they say that to get a, a very precise reading, you need triangulation. You need to get three different points on a map. Like if you look at it, you find a, 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 a landmark on the horizon and you draw a line, you know, to your, your azimuth and you draw you do that three times, three different times, and you get a little triangle. That's where you are in the triangle. Well, here we have a, like six lines drawn. You have, as I mentioned, you have so many that you have uh, the emperor, these three different um, uh, governors, you have the high priest, you have, you know, the man's own father. So, so it is like so precise that he, he uh, the gospel readers want us to know um, not only who exa- and exactly where it was, but that they were careful that we would know who it was. So just a, 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 a re, uh, an intensification of um, accuracy there. So don't, don't buy it when people say that uh, the, go- the gospel writers were imprecise or kind of added details on their own or weren't so concerned with uh, precision. Don't, don't buy that. Oh, and then the, the lesson, so that's, that's the, um, the precision of it. The lesson, uh, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, the crooked shall be made straight, the rough ways plain, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So this really is, this is our lesson, this is our takeaway from the, all the readings today. Uh, the mountains and valleys shall, uh, or the mountains shall be made low. Lower your vices, right? The mountains are those excesses of our behavior, the excess of vice. Bring them down. Uh, the valleys are the deficiencies of our virtue. Fill them up. Uh, the crooked uh, shall be made straight, right? We're erring. Uh, so we're maybe not doing evil, but we're straying from the path. What's the most direct path to God? You know, we stray. We waste time. We're idle. We wander here. We wander there. Be focused. Right? We stay straight on, on, on the path of God. Uh, the rough ways shall be made plain. Uh, very often, we make things more confusing than they need to be. We complicate things. Uh, it's very simple. Love God, uh, love your neighbor, uh, and you shall fulfill the whole law. Uh, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Remember at the beginning, right? God desires even the conversion of the Egyptians, those people we see as the source of our problems, the source of our sins, our enemies. They can be converted. God wants all flesh to be saved. So um, very brief kind of overview. This is... <clears throat> how we should be reading the scriptures when we're at Mass, uh, before Mass. Uh, what can I gain out of this? And we, again, we didn't even look at the context. I even skipped one of the whole lessons. Um, you know, reading the entire chapter, read all of Isaiah 45, read Isaiah 44, read Isaiah 46. Uh, you, you can find a lot by doing that. But this is a simple way of, of meditating upon the daily scriptures, thinking analogically, um, thinking with, with the mind of the church, kind of applying a spiritual uh, um, uh, meaning to it. Uh, so this is this is how we can do it, right? How we can um, meditate each day upon the scriptures and continue preparing ourselves for the coming of God. Uh, so God bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.